Hello, welcome back everyone. Greetings from Indonesia. Good morning from Indonesia and welcome back to the 19th Indo Anesthesia 2022. Today we will have a lot of great sessions with uh, many prominent speakers in this field and I would like to welcome all participants for this uh, event. We will still have Indo Anesthesia until next week. So this is our week three and next, we're, next week will be our last week uh, of Indo Anesthesia. Indo Anesthesia Virtual Symposium. Selamat datang kepada seluruh rekan-rekan yang di Indonesia. Terima kasih yang sudah mendaftar. Kepada teman-teman di Indonesia, diingatkan juga nanti pada akhir sesi, seperti biasa, kita ada tiga door prize untuk tiga pemenang yang beruntung. Jadi kita saya mau mengundang teman-teman untuk aktif bertanya di, dal di dalam kolom Q&A. Setelah itu juga terus ikuti acara Indo Anesthesia sampai nanti sore. Uh, Oke, okay, so we will move on to the first session of the day, we will discuss uh, about perioperative medicine. Uh, for this session, we will have three prominent speakers. The first one is Professor Bafani Kodali from the USA. Hello, I believe it's good evening Hello. for you. Hi. And the second speaker is Professor Michael Irwin from Hong Kong. Hi. And the last but not least is Professor Kim Jin Tae from South Korea. Hello. Hello. And for this session, it will be led by uh, Dr. Ratna Farida from Indonesia. Please, Dr. Ratna Farida. Thank you very much, Krisa. Good morning, everybody. It's a bright Sunday morning in Jakarta, and I hope you all in good health and ready to start the day. We have three distinguished speakers, at, uh, as Krisa has mentioned before. And now we will start to the <coughs> first topic of perioperative medicine, which will be um, presented by Dr. Bhavani Kodali. Uh, it's a professor in anesthesiology, in, especially in obstetric anesthesia in University of Maryland Medical Center in Baltimore, United States. Please, Dr. Kodali, time is yours. Thank you. I'm going to share my slides. So good morning, everyone. And, and today, uh, first of all, I have to thank the organizers of the Indo-Anesthesia meeting for inviting me for this conference, and particularly Dr. Shushilo Chandra, whom I have known for several years now. Now, today I'm going to talk about postpartum hemorrhage, a roadmap to success, a strategy that cannot be ignored. And I'm going to give a very practical uh, you know, strategy. I do have disclosures to make. I mean, I do maintain a website, capnography.com, which is available free for everyone. And I also maintain a website for patients who, who are interested for labor analgesia or obstetric analgesia and anesthesia. It is called as painfreebirthing.com and it is available in about 10 languages. Now, obstetric hemorrhage are, is not blue, it is red. Once it bleeds, you can see blood everywhere. The reason being, the uterine blood flow increases from, from 100 ml to 700 ml per minute at term. And therefore, within three minutes, you can be losing up to two to three liters of blood. Now, Taj Mahal, you all know, is a grim reminder of an obstetric tragedy, and which is postpartum hemorrhage. It is said that Mumtaj actually died of postpartum hemorrhage. So it has been over 300 years, or more than 350 years now, and we are still battling postpartum hemorrhage or obstetric hemorrhage, and still we do not have a good handle of, of this. Now, if you look at some of the data from Indonesia itself, when you look at the risk factors for postpartum hemorrhage, eclampsia, premature rupture of membranes, placenta previa, and premature or post-term pregnancies, and high parity were, were found to be the risk factors for obstetric hemorrhage, which is, and these are well-known factors. 
If you look at the another paper from Padang, where they looked at the maternal deaths due to obstetric hemorrhage, what they found was there were 20 deaths caused by obstetric hemorrhage during 215 to 219, and the most common etiology of the obstetric hemorrhage was uterine atony. So uterine atony is one of the important factors in this death. Now, in Indonesia, they also looked at the near misses and deaths, obstetric near misses and deaths in public and private hospitals in Indonesia. Of course, the prevalence of near, the near misses was much greater in public hospitals, which is probably the trend all over the world. But hemorrhage and hypertensive diseases were the two important factors where, where there were several near misses. So therefore, every one of us who are practicing obstetric, obstetric emergencies or obstetric anesthesia or care for pregnant women, we are going to face obstetric hemorrhage. When you look at the physiology of pregnancy, it actually it is a good safeguard against postpartum hemorrhage. For example, when you look at the cardiovascular changes, the increase in cardiac output and the blood volume actually protects the pregnant woman from certain amount of blood loss. That is why pregnant women do well despite losing blood during obstetric hemorrhage. Of course, tragedy occurs when it goes beyond certain limits. And that is why we are here to discuss. And that we all know that there is hypercoagulation of pregnancy and this itself is a protective mechanism against postpartum or obstetric hemorrhage. Now, when hemorrhage occurs, it is actually dramatic and the life of the pregnant woman hangs by threat. For example, I was on call and an epidural was placed at 2.30 and, I, and the patient did cough around 15 hours. There was a transient decrease in oxygen saturation. And at 16 hours, she delivered vaginal, she had vaginal delivery and I was called into the room for significant postpartum hemorrhage. We took the patient to the operating room. In this case, the diagnosis was actually amniotic fluid embolism. And you look at the first labs of the coagulation, PT was 55 with an INR of 6.1 and fibrinogen was less than 60. So we, trans so we gave the one to one to one transfusion. We gave cryoprecipitate, calcium, we maintained acid-base balance, we maintained the temperature of the patient and we also used Rheostap, which is a fibrinogen. So initially we used you know, seven units of each and some you know, cryo and platelets. So by about four hours, as you can see here, we actually normalized the PTT, I mean PT and PTT, and the INR is 1.2 and fibrinogen was 255 from 60, but she continued to bleed and later they proceeded with a hysterectomy. And totally she had about 50 units, combined RBCs and FFT. So, the golden rule of PPH is it is unpredictable and therefore we have to be always ready. So what do you do? Of course, apart from the you know, praying God, we can do several things. We can lay down a strategy and certainly we, <clears throat> we want to take a path towards success and have a living patient with us. So in the roadmap, the first one is read and understand the current recommendations. And this is very important. ACOG has published and many obstetric societies and anesthesia societies have published this maternal safety bundle for obstetric hemorrhage. And every hospital or unit that takes care of pregnant patients must understand this. It actually involves four R's. The first one is readiness. That means we have to be always ready to manage obstetric hemorrhage. The second one is recognition. That means you should actually recognize what are the factors that, that, are, that predispose for pregnant women for hemorrhage. That is why we should recognize and certain times we can prevent some of the factors. Then of course comes the 
response. We have to respond to these hemorrhages adequately. And the last one is reporting. Reporting and learning means we pull our, our whole mechanism of action in a case and see what is the feedback and how we can improve ourselves for future management of these critical patients. The second one is preparation and layout plan. You must involve all these groups, obstetricians, anesthesiologists, laboratory personnel, ancillary staff, nurses, and of course, blood bank, and lay down a plan for the management of obstetric hemorrhage. Then of course, as I said, blood bank is one of the critical factors in the management because the blood occurs very rapidly, the blood loss. So because the blood loss occurs rapidly, it needs a massive transfusion. And massive transfusion is generally defined. It has several definitions as I have outlined here. But generally, if you replace 50% of the blood volume in about three hours, it, is, it can be defined as massive hemorrhage. So when there is a massive blood loss, you need massive transfusion. And when for massive transfusion, you need massive transfusion protocols. That is why the blood bank becomes very important factor. Because there are three important things. When you have a massive transfusion protocol, you can have a rapid and timely delivery of large amount of the blood to the operating rooms. For example, if the patient with unknown blood type O, o, o negative or O positive RBCs with ABFF. Then they can also send predetermined mix of RBCs, FFPs, and platelets. And of course, it reduces the time because everyone knows the job because it is already planned out. The blood bank knows, everyone knows, and therefore blood comes very, very quickly to the operating room. So this is just one of the samples of a massive transfusion. Usually, you know, we get about six units of blood first, followed by plasma and also a bag of platelets. And this process continues until we call the blood bank and say we are under control. So therefore, there has to be a strategy of communicating with the, with the, with the blood bank. Now, pull resources from various places. When I was lecturing in India, I always suggest to the hospitals there that smaller hospitals will not be able to get large quantities of blood. Therefore, they must have some source of a resource pooling within the city so that one hospital, when it is in trouble, they get blood from the other hospitals and later on they can settle their account. And I'm not sure how it works in Indonesia, whether the blood is available at all places easily or not, that I'm not aware of it, but this is something that can be worked out. The next one is, of course, backup personnel. Now, everyone who is taking care of pregnant patients must always know who is the backup person who is going to help each of us when we are in trouble. That includes nurses. You know, like for example, it's always better to have a nursing coordinator when there is a crisis in obstetric. Uh, obstetric hemorrhage. When there's an obstetric hemorrhage, a coordinator can actually make sure that everything is going according to the whatever pre-arranged plan of the strategy. So they appoint a resource nurse. So who actually says, okay, we are, we are getting blood, the labs have been sent, these are the results, etc. And also the obstetrician should know who is the backup because they need to put a battery balloon, or they need to use uterine sutures, compression sutures like beeline sutures, or sometimes they may have to ligate the uterine arteries. So therefore, everyone should know who is their backup so that the backup person can come and help. The next important thing is, of course, assessment and estimation of blood loss. This is a very important factor in obstetric care. Most of us, we underestimate the blood loss and that is what leads to continued maternal mortality and morbidity in many countries. 
Because what happens in the optic hemorrhage is they lose about a liter and then everything is stable. Next, they lose about another 500, it becomes stable. Then they lose about 500. So we should not see this in silos, but rather someone should watch in a continuous process to determine what has been the total blood loss in a given patient. Now, of course, clinically itself, we can know how much a patient has lost. For example, if someone has got, say, the heart rate goes up to 120 to 160s and peripheries are cold and hypotension, we know that this patient has roughly lost about 30 to 35% of the blood volume, and therefore we have to make preparations for that. And for class four, almost over three liters of blood loss when there is a hypotension and oligemia. So the clinical presentation is one of the important factors too. Of course, there are other ongoing things like regional anesthetic drugs and also oxytocin, but this is one of the critical features we have to always remember in an ongoing hemorrhage. We can actually use two methods of blood loss very easily. One is a visual estimation. Just by approximation and looking at the blood at various places and the gauze pieces, we can come up with a reasonable value. It may not be accurate. Now we can say, okay, maybe 500 or 2000. We can also do quantitative estimation by weight. That means you, you, you measure what is the blood, um, I mean, loss in the canister after taking away the amniotic fluid, and also you weigh the swabs and you can estimate the blood loss. And of course, there are certain sophisticated methods like Triton that uses a camera, and then it tells what is the blood loss, but then it is also, there has to be a person doing all this. And when this paper was published where they used the Triton to assess the blood loss, and I wrote a small correspondence on this paper. What I said, as what I said before, I said, if someone keeps a cumulative blood loss over time, that is the most important feature because we normally don't account for the blood loss that occurs at various stages of blood loss. And, that, and once you do, that gives us a very good estimate of blood loss. And second one is you have to have two methods, which are simple. One is visual, and the second one is the weighing method. If the disparity between these two methods is more than usual, then you have to be extremely careful to monitor this patient, get the repeated labs, and make sure that we, are, we have a good control of this, or good assessment of this patient. So when the disparity is more, that itself is a red flag for us that Look, guys, we have to be careful. We don't know what is the blood loss here. Let's get the labs done and monitor this patient carefully. The next important is prevention of coagulation derangement in a patient who is bleeding. This is one of the critical points which I always make sure and I always try to teach all the residents and fellows. Now, when the blood loss occurs, can we, prevent, can we prevent coagulopathy? Is that better strategy? The answer is yes. It is always a better strategy to prevent coagulation because if the coagulation is normal, you can tell the obstetricians that this is a surgical bleed. Please don't say it is a coagulopathy. Make sure that you, you have all your, all your eyes on, on the uterus and surrounding areas to determine what is the cause of the bleeding. Now, what happens to the fibrinogen during obstetric hemorrhage? It actually takes a nose dive. And we know that when the fibrinogen falls below 200 milligrams, then it is a predictive, it is positive predictive value of 100 for postpartum hemorrhage. So somewhere around 200, we think it is a critical value. Now, there are, we all know that there are conventional you know, laboratory tests, I mean, tests like PT, PT, PTT, INR, fibrinogen, we have TAG, but all these tests take about 45 minutes to one hour. So how do you assess coagulation quickly? 
In fact, we are one of the centers which are lucky that to have both TEG and Rotom available to us 24 by 7. Quantra is a new coagulation analyzer, which is very easy to use and you get, in fact, we use this in one of our papers and what we found, you get the results in about 12 minutes and it actually predicts fibrinogen very well. You just take a sample of the blue top, which you collected and you just put it into the cartridge and start the machine and you get the results in about 30 minutes. In absence of all these things, and because these tests take time, I always do the simple test. Whenever I send blood for coagulation, I take little blood into the right tube, and then I, I just leave it for about 10 minutes. If the blood clots in 10 minutes, I know that there is no significant coagulopathy, and I tell the obstetricians, this is a surgical bleeding, the blood is still coagulating well. Now you look at other labs to figure out how close you are to, how close you are within that normal range and what you should continue to give. This is just sometimes I do tag and this method. In fact, recently a paper came from India where they evaluated this test against the conventional laboratories and they found fairly good regression line for fibrinogen and also this point of the care. And what they found here is, if the clotting time is more than 11 minutes, the fibrinogen is around 158. I use it about 10 minutes as my, I've been using 10 minutes for almost, almost about 10 years now. I have been using this test for 10 years, but this paper came out very, very recent. So this is a very simple test and I think we can all do it. Now, I call that as a poor man's tech, as you can see here, poor man's tech. Now, if all the labs are normal and the poor man's tech is of course normal, then you prevent coagulopathy. If they are abnormal, then you start your transfusions, et cetera. And then of course, we, you know, once you correct coagulopathy, the next step is prevent a coagulopathy to occur again. So you have to be on top of it all the time. Then of course, we all know that TXA is a good thing when there is a blood loss over a liter. And then we always attempt to maintain fibrinogen over 200 milligrams. And now one important point, which, or I should say two important points. What is the blood loss in a patient that can decrease fibrinogen to below 200? I'll try to answer that question. And another important thing is fluids. Don't give too much of fluids to the patient. And the reason for that is we know that the oncotic, the normal oncotic pressure in a non-pregnant patient is about 24. It decreases to about 19 in pregnancy. And if someone has preeclampsia, it decreases further to 17. So when you give fluids, what happens is the Starling's equation is always favors towards pulmonary edema. Therefore, the fluid actually leaves the capillaries and produces pulmonary edema. So because of that, it is probably better not to give fluids. Of course, you are in a situation where there are no products, there is nothing. Of course, then you have no other alternate. So this is a paper that came from Europe where it is a retrospective study and where they determined fibrinogen and the amount of the blood loss. And here, if you look at the fibrinogen graph, about 2.5 to 3 liters, the fibrinogen begins to go below 200. Therefore, if someone loses 2,500 ml or more, probably you have to start thinking about fibrinogen that it could be low. So the three, about a couple of points about the hemorrhage and what I have said now is refrain from giving too much of fluids. It activates a fibrolytic mechanism and also produces dilutional coagulopathy in addition to the pulmonary edema, which I said. Then of course, I, and then HESPAN is not a very good choice again, if you have a choice, because if you give more than a liter or up to liter, there could be some coagulopathy. It, it could interfere with coagulopathy. 
and therefore you can limit up to 500. I tend to use actually albumin in these patients, you know, until I get blood. Then as I said, if it is approaching 2.5 liters of blood loss, be cautious of, of coagulopathy development. And see, another important point is we don't measure fibrinogen in pregnancy normally, correct? When actually, when we measure, when we do placenta accreta, so, I mean, cases, we actually measure fibrinogen. The reason is the fibrinogen can range anywhere from 250 to 650 in a pregnant patient. If someone has got a very high fibrinogen, their margin of safety is more. Whereas if someone has a low fibrinogen to start with, then their margin of safety is less. So if you are getting a case where we're expecting to bleed in a patient, probably having a baseline fibrinogen is also a good idea. Then of course, the triad of death, you have to maintain good temperature, prevent acidosis, because this, these two can produce coagulopathy. Coagulopathy can I mean, produce bleeding and the bleeding can produce again, uh, you know, hypothermia. So it is a vicious cycle. Then, of course, I say what is called as a quad of death, calcium. Calcium is very important, as you all know, because we have to have enough calcium for coagulation. Therefore, hypocalcemia should not, you know, we should not have hypocalcemia uh, occurring in a patient who is bleeding and you're transfusing. So we have to be on top of it and give calcium. Monitoring, yes, it is an essential factor when there is an obstetric hemorrhage in, in the obstetric hemorrhage management, arterial line placement, adequate intravenous access, cardiac output. If there's an arterial line, we can always use cardiac output measurements because then you can measure the stroke volume and then correct your, your volumes. And or we can also use non-invasive cardiac output monitors because there are two, three varieties of non-invasive cardiac output monitors that can also give a fair idea about cardiac output stroke volume. Then of course, keep the temperature, monitor the temperature and keep the temperature as normal as possible. Entitled CO2 monitoring is essential, particularly when there's an ongoing hemorrhage and the patient has got general anesthesia because there is a very good relationship between CO2, entitled CO2 and cardiac output. If the entitled CO2 is below 28, the cardiac output is around four liters. And if it is 20, the cardiac output is two liters. So it can give you a fair amount of idea about cardiac output. Then of course, frequent labs and EKG. Everyone should be familiar with aortic compression, like bimanual aortic compression. It's a very good strategy when there's acute hemorrhage and you know, with a fist, you can compress the aorta against the spine until the obstetrician actually fixes the hemorrhage. So, so how do I conclude? Minutes, uh, left, Prof. How, do, how do I conclude? It is unpredictable. Prepare yourself for the obstetric hemorrhage. Don't panic. Start communications with the group. Have a protocol for obstetric hemorrhage and initiate the protocol of the obstetric hemorrhage, which I have said, and then mobilization of help is very, very critical for the success of the program. And think transport to a different institution. Just there are a couple of publications, New England Journal has a review article on postpartum hemorrhage, then tranoxamic acid in the prevention of loss of, uh, you know, I mean, blood loss after cesarean delivery. And then there is a good paper on uh, you know recently published in anesthesia and GC about placenta accretus uh, you know spectrum disorders and what are the knowledge gaps and there are this is also another paper recently published disparities in obstetric hemorrhage and outcomes you know country wise or it could be race wise or it could be the number of you know availability of the blood units particularly in low income areas the blood availability of the Blood donations are less, therefore, availability is also less. Thank you very much, and thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Thank you very much, uh, Prof. Kodali. Very interesting topic that we are still facing now. 
Okay, a lot of uh, question for you, but we will discuss it later. Next, we will continue to our second speaker, um, Dr. Um, excuse me, I can. Okay. Our next speaker. Uh, sorry. <clears throat> Dr. Erwin. Professor Michael G. Erwin is uh, a professor in anesthesiology in Hong Kong. He was the past uh, president of uh, Society of Anesthesiologists in Hong Kong and a lot of uh, publications and still uh, doing researches, especially in um, effects of anesthesia on cancer. Please, uh, Professor Erwin, time is yours. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Radna, for that <coughs> introduction. Let me just uh, share my screen with you. Okay, can you all see that? Is that okay? Yes, yes, okay. clearly. Good, thanks. Okay, so um, as, you, as you mentioned uh, this morning, I'm going to talk about uh, the uh, way that I think that anesthesia can influence uh, outcomes after cancer surgery. And uh, my declarations are um, got a number of editorial uh, board uh, commitments, uh, mostly with the journal Anesthesia, um, but also with Paraplyte Medicine, Expert Opinion Pharmacotherapy, uh, Pharmacology, and uh, the Hong Kong Medical Journal. I have no pharmaceutical associations. So I'm going to outline the considerations for cancer surgery in this talk, and then talk a little bit about uh, anesthesia and cancer, how anesthesia may affect cancer, because it's been known for quite some time that it may exacerbate cancer. And we will also touch on some other aspects such as pain and cancer. Now, unfortunately, cancer is increasing, uh, although the, the treatments available are also increasing and uh, fortunately, so there are better and better treatments, but many patients who have cancer will need surgery, probably around 80% of patients with cancer will need surgery at some point uh, in their uh, management. This is data, the most recent data from the World Cancer Report. It can be various types of, of surgery. It could be a definitive uh, adjuvant or palliative. Um, could be to minimize local recurrence, clear the margins. It generally takes precedence over pr preserving non-vital structure. So in some cases, the surgery can be very, very extensive. Mm -hmm. And many patients who've had cancer surgery go on to die from metastatic disease. And there are some concerns that what we do in terms of the surgery may actually make this worse. There's also quite a high potential for uh, chronic pain after these procedures. The surgery can be, uh, you know, not just major, but really ultra major. This is a, a case I had recently actually where a patient uh, with a tumor in the, in the spine uh, needed to have that removed. And you can imagine that that's really quite, uh, uh, quite a big surgery to do in a patient like this. Um, so I think we're all kind of used to doing these kind of major procedures. And it took about, I think about eight or nine hours this operation. Uh, there's an acronym, which I think is very important, uh, the RIOT, um, which, which stands for Return to Intended Oncological Therapy. Now this is a very interesting and novel quality indicator. And it really reflects that surgery may be just one part of the patient's treatment. And uh, uh, it may be, you know, an initiating treatment, or it may be done sometimes after some chemotherapy or some radiotherapy to reduce the size of surgery. But very often, these patients will need to go back to some sort of medical uh, treatment, and that can be delayed and hampered by an, uh, an impaired surgical recovery. So we also have responsibility to give an anesthesia where we can get patients back to normal as quickly as possible. So this is where sort of more modern concepts like enhanced recovery after surgery, evidence-based parenteral medicine, 
uh, come into play to look at areas such as nutrition, pain, nausea, vomiting, mobility, and so on. Remember that deep end thrombosis is more common after cancer surgery and may need to take precautions against that also. So I, I kind of alluded a little bit at the beginning that this not, although there's been a lot of interest in this in recent few years, this is something which you know surgeons and doctors have known about for really quite a long time. Uh, the first record of circulating tumor cells uh, was in 1869. In 1910, uh, Marie and Cunet uh, found that, that surgery could enhance the growth of distal metastasis. They called this a, a threpsia. Uh, the growth stimulating effects of, uh, of um, surgery on tumors was identified in the 1950s. Angiogenesis in the 1990s, and then it's in the last sort of um, 10 to 20 years where we've started to really think about what type of anesthesia uh, we're giving in terms of how that may modify uh, many of these uh, other factors. Now, it, it, it was known, uh, you know, maybe it's, as I say, it's around 20 years ago that anesthetic drugs uh, if, if, in, in looking at things like cell cultures and all, and this is not in, in vitro, uh, seem to have adverse effects on, uh, on uh, uh, natural killer cell function. Natural killer cells, uh, as you imagine, are important for killing cancer cells. And <clears throat> drugs like bipenzone and halpin would reduce this natural killer cell activity, whereas propofol would increase it. There was a bit of controversy about opioids in terms of their role here because. There was some experimental evidence that opioids could enhance angiogenesis. So there then were concerns that uh, opioids could make things worse. Um, a few years later, so this is a, a cartoon that was published in Anesthesia Analgesia, which kind of summarizes the concerns of various anesthetic interventions. At this time, you can see, uh, and this is an interesting article to have a look at if you're interested in, in the field of the a lot of the work's been superseded. But you can see that there are many different factors that could interplay during a surgical procedure that could influence metastasis. And many of these factors could be secondarily influenced by our choice of anesthetic drugs, analgesic drugs, and other adjuvants, even beta blockers, for example. Now, the unanswered question here, I think, is what is the contribution of anesthetic drugs to immune modulation relative to all the other factors that are occurring? So we, we it's not just obviously administration of anesthesia, it's one aspect, but how is the tumor being handled? Uh, what about things like catecholamines, the stress response to surgery, cytokines that are released as a result of tissue injury, pain itself, which may mod modulate uh, the immune function of those of you who manage patients with chronic pain would know this very well. Uh, we heard in the last talk about blood transfusion and some of the aspects of blood transfusion, temperature homeostasis. These are all important issues as well. So uh, around uh, 2010, there was a, a, a sudden increase in uh, uh, sort of excitement about this because of uh, a, a number of studies that were published around that time and mainly they were related to the effects of opioids. So you can see even in, in, in quite important, uh, um, these are kind of like uh, not, not scientific journals per se, but they're more the type of um, well-written scientific articles for the general public and saying here that morphine could make uh, uh, things worse. So why was this? Well, um, we know actually quite a lot about opioids and their effect, and it's actually quite interesting because there are, there are, there's kind of a bifid effect from opioids. There are some reasons that opioids could increase cancer recurrence through their kind of new opioid receptor induced activities and suppression of innate immunity. But also, uh, morphine is a very potent inducer of apoptosis in certain types of cancer, like human lung cancer. It can inhibit cell proliferation in other cancers. Too glioblastoma, colorectal or sarcoma, and in fact has also been used to enhance the anti-cancer activity of certain chemotherapeutic agents. So it's not quite as simple as you know you might think that oh, opioids are, are bad because uh, 
Uh, opioids are also one of our kind of gold standard analgesics, and we know that uh, quality of life and, and pain and reduction of pain are very important in recovery also. It may, th th there have been suggestions that it may even be dose-related. Dose this is a study which looked at patients having esophageal cancer surgery. They looked at patients who received high versus low interrupted dose of opioids, in this case, it's uh, fentanyl, and then evaluated uh, the recurrence-free survival and overall survival. Now, they find that it, it actually differs a little bit between um, uh, uh, squamous cell carcinoma and adenocarcinoma. You can see that the prob probability actually find that with uh, with the uh, with the with the higher doses, uh, the survival <coughs> uh, was actually worse than with the lower doses. So it seemed that uh, particularly in um, adenocarcinoma, there was uh, sorry squamous cell carcinoma, there was a benefit from higher doses of fentanyl as opposed to lower doses. It didn't seem to make any difference in the other types. So again, suggesting there may be a dose difference, and also there may be a difference in propensity with different uh, types of tumor. Uh, there are a number of studies looked at uh, uh, regional anesthesia and the effect of regional anesthesia. Uh, the problem with these, really, why I want to illustrate here is not the studies, but the fact that these are very small studies and very much underpowered. Um, they do things like comparing um, recurrence-free survival versus epidural versus PCA. Um, but but either retrospective or very small and very difficult to have decent power for that sort of study. So most of the research has been retrospective, small and poorly controlled. They actually the only big perspective study that was done, in fact, was the, the master trial. The master trial actually was designed to look at morbidity and mortality with epidural analgesia and high-risk patients undergoing major surgery. It wasn't actually designed for this. But they, uh, because of the nature of the trial, they had actually included quite a lot of patients who were having surgery for cancer. It was around, around 500. And because of the trial design, half of these were randomized to receive epidural and half no uh, epidural with the got opioid-based analgesia. And as you can see from this master um, uh, study, um, Kaplan-Meier survival, there was absolutely no difference between epidural or systemic opioids in patient survival over a period of 12 years. So I think this is uh, very supportive that we don't really need to be too concerned about uh, opioids. This is one looking at, again, look at regional analgesia on gastroesophageal cancer surgery, and it was a systematic review of literature. Again, they found no evidence to support or refute use of epidural anesthesia or analgesia in terms of reducing cancer occurrence after this type of surgery. Uh, I think epidural is obviously very good in terms of the quality of pain relief, and I use it a lot, but I don't think there is enough evidence to, to use it specifically to reduce cancer occurrence. So there are a number of concerns, but limited clinical data. We have to remember there are other things that are important, like hemodynamic stability and patient comfort. We, we can address this a little bit, you know, the immediate post-operative pain can, can hamper the return to intended oncological therapy. And in the long term, if we don't treat acute pain well, it may well develop chronic pain problems. So is surgery really a trigger for cancer occurrence metastasis? Well, there are a lot of potential inducing factors, and you could even say that it's kind of like a perfect storm uh, cancer surgery. Uh, for, for the development of recurrence and metastasis. You see all these various things that occur during that period. The tumor microenvironment fiber is very complex. There are a lot of uh, uh, ways in which the uh, uh, metastatic cells or tumor could be killed. There are also ways in which they could actually be given a, a nice microenvironment to actually grow. And we have to think about what we are doing and what drugs we're using that may have effects on that. So if we take propofol, for example, you can see that propofol has a, a number of very positive effects 
on this tumor microenvironment, decreasing proliferation, decreasing migration, decreasing invasion, and increasing cell apoptosis. So profol having positive effects on all these various aspects of the tumor microenvironment. So that's a very interesting one. That's been shown in uh, quite a number of in vivo trials. And so this now why we're now a lot of people are looking at propofol prospectively in the clinical setting. Propofol also uh, is a very powerful antioxidant. The fact that it resembles one of the vitamin E analogs, alpha-tosulfurol, anti-inflammatory, inhibits production of pro-inflammatory cytokines, has um, <coughs> no effect on the natural killer cell function in vivo or in vitro, unlike some other drugs which tend to impair that and then can enhance cytotoxic and site activity. So there's a lot of um, basic science evidence supportive of propofol. Now, in the clinical sense, most of the studies that we've seen are, again, a bit like you know, the earlier studies in opioids, so, uh, retrospective. And you know, as you obviously know, there are a lot of problems with retrospective uh, uh, surgery. Uh, they, the most important one was probably the uh, study which was done in the Royal Marsden Hospital, showing major differences. This is a more recent one, which looked at long-term oncological outcomes with breast conserving surgery, showing a benefit of propofol versus the non-propofol technique in terms of patient survival over a longer period of time. This was just published a few months ago. Um, you can see that the, the studies generally, uh, most of them are supportive. Obviously, cancer is quite a heterogeneous disease. So there are a lot of different tissues that can have cancer, you know, gastric, esophageal, breast, and so on. So this is just a, a, um, a table looking at these various different studies. Uh, and what we're seeing here is although they're generally very positive, they, <clears throat> the problem is they're mostly retrospective. And I, and I think this is a problem because we really need proper randomized controlled trials to look at this. The biggest one, um, as I mentioned, was that the one published by Timothy Wigmore and his colleagues from the Royal Marsden Hospital. It's a, a cancer hospital in London. They, they only do cancer surgery. They're very keen on inter intravenous anesthesia there. So they looked back and did propensity matching in a, a group of 7,000 patients who received inhalational uh, versus uh, total intravenous anesthesia and find that mortality was about 50% higher with the inhalation than with the intravenous. The adjusted hazard ratio is 1.46, so nearly a 50% difference. This is really huge, and this really made uh, many people sit up and think about um, what we're doing uh, in terms of our uh, uh, anesthesia administration and how that may be influence, influencing patients survival after surgery. You can see this is the Kaplan-Meier survival curve. It didn't matter whether these were ASA1 or ASA3 patients. Uh, the, the differences were there very clearly um, in, in, in no matter what. So this was really quite exciting. There have been some other anesthesia uh, oncology outcomes, systematic reviews, again, support, uh, supportive. Uh, this one, it was interesting. This is one which didn't include the data from the uh, from the, the Wigmore trial because it, it's so big that it would probably skew their results. It looked at 19 retrospective studies. They found, interestingly, that propofol was generally associated with better overall survival after cancer surgery. Uh, so it's not just that it may be affecting cancer itself, but the actual quality of recovery and the and survival from actually other causes as well. So a lot of stuff. There are many other reasons why we would want to use uh, inhalation, uh, uh, intravenous anesthesia anyway. There's more and more evidence suggesting that uh, intravenous anesthesia attenuates post-operative cognitive dysfunction and that cognitive status may be higher and systemic inflammation less severe after post anesthesia in the early days after surgery. So there's more and more uh, evidence for this. And again, as I say, propofol generally will su suppress oncogenesis. There's actually been a couple of studies 
in cell culture suggesting they may actually promote oncogenesis. Only two studies, one in gallbladder and one in breast cancer, but most of them uh, give a very strong um, you know, scientific rationale for overall being of benefit in this setting. So majority of studies are supportive for protective effect of hopeful, and there are very plausible mechanistics, uh, mechanistic reasons for this from, from you know, basic science studies, but many clinical studies are retrospective, and what we really need are good prospective randomized control trials. And in fact, there are a number of these ongoing presently, and hopefully we'll have some um, data from these in a year or two, because obviously they take really quite a long time to recruit thousands of patients. Generally, they're uh, multi-center uh, studies. So <clears throat> propofol may, uh, uh, it does seem to have a difference. And why is this? It could be a negative effect of inhalation anesthetics, could be a beneficial effect of propofol, or a combination of these things, or it could even be some other unknown confounding factors. So we have to be very careful how we think about it. This is Linus Pauling. Linus Pauling is probably one of the cleverer scientists uh, of the last century. Uh, he is one, one of the only people to receive a Nobel Prize and may, maybe the only one to receive a Nobel Prize in two different disciplines. Uh, he became fixate, fixated with vitamin C being a panacea for uh, illness, particularly in reducing cancer. And this, this fact, that, this fact that, sorry, excuse me, um, Despite the fact that he was you know, extremely intelligent and had done a huge amount of excellent research, he was so fixated by this that he would fire his research staff if they found uh, results which contravened this. So you really you know, have to think rationally about this and not you know, jump to conclusions. That's why we need good prospective trials. So lidocaine also, lidocaine also seems to have uh, possible benefits and just a, an illustration here of some of the ways in which you can typically dose lidocaine. There's much less data in this, but there are, are some suggesting that there may be very modest difference. You're looking at only 68% versus 62% um, and 34 versus 27 for a three-year survival, but lidocaine may also have a role in uh, prevention. So what about the future? I think drug combinations to combat drug uh, resistance are really important. Formulating drugs that may be composed with other can cancer agents, even giving these drugs during the time of surgery is possible. And the interesting thing about lidocaine is that they, it, it's known to be a chemosensitizer and uh, has actually been studied in terms of its ability to chemosensitize certain um, drugs such as cisplatin and 5-FU and so on. Um, it may have some epigenetic, actually just showing you some of the various uh, mechanisms. So there is uh, some potential application for uh, lidocaine in the future. Nitrous oxide, sometimes fair to that, it's a wild, wild west because there are very good things with nitrous oxide. It's cheap, it's a good analgesic, uh, short acting, but there are bad, and then there are plain ugly effects such as depression of the thionine synthesis increasing vitamin B12 function and so on, some neurotoxicity, more in sort of longer term administration, of course. But I do think nitrous oxide is probably a drug to be avoided in patients with cancer. A lot of interest in ketamine. Ketamine uh, is excellent as an adjuvant analgesic in major surgery. Um, and there have been a few studies which show that it may have an immunomodulatory effect in certain types of surgery. This looked particularly at colorectal surgery, looked at two-year cancer recurrence, uh, found that it didn't actually have a favorable impact on post-operative natural killer cell activity and France response or prognosis in these patients. But importantly, it didn't do any harm, it didn't make things any worse. So I think ketamine still has a role, has a role as a kind of preventive and adjuvant analgesic, but I don't think there's much or evidence that it does anything in terms of reducing cancer risk. What about choice of anesthetists? This is a kind of controversial one, but there have been studies showing that care 
certain types of surgery, this one particularly with the complex gastrointestinal surgery, things like esophagectomy and so on, that care by anesthetists who were doing these cases a lot, i.e. high volume, was independently associated with lower odds of 90-day morbidity and readmission, uh, major morbidity and unplanned ICU admission. Fortunately, the, the uh, instance of death was low, so the study would have been under par to show any differences in mortality, but certainly in terms of major morbidity, uh, there was a difference. And uh, so what we're doing, not just aside from the drugs that we use, but in our expertise in managing these patients variably, just like you heard about the management of a major obstetric hemorrhage, uh, that will make a difference. Dexmendomine seems to attenuate in immunosuppression in patients undergoing cancer surgery. There are quite a few uh, studies looking at this as well. So, uh, and dexmendomine also reduces catecholamine secretion, uh, as I'm sure you know, it's an alpha-2 agonist. And the reduction in catecholamine seems to be something which may be beneficial for patients having cancer. So uh, dexmendomine may also have a role. But the choice of anesthesia may well influence cancer outcomes. I'm going to talk about this next week in another lecture. Um, if we look at EBPOM, enhanced recovery, return to oncological therapy, I think there is no doubt that uh, anesthesia does influence uh, cancer outcomes. But when we look at cancer occurrence and patient survival, then I think the, there is quite good evidence there to support that. But nothing really definitive in terms of good randomized control uh, trial research. And that's something that we're looking, uh, that we're excited about getting uh, within the next few years. So a number of different ways that we should be managing patients uh, optimally for cancer surgery. You can see here are various different aspects. I think you all would be fairly familiar with this. I think intravenous anesthesia is a very important one of these. Avoiding nitrous oxide is probably important as well. A general stress reduction, I think you know, this is something we're all probably doing, trying to provide good analgesia. Don't worry about opioids. I don't think there is uh, enough evidence to suggest that opioids uh, are uh, a risk in cancer recurrence, uh, patients having cancer surgery. I wrote an article for anesthesia uh, uh, last year, year or two, actually two years now, uh, on uh, on propofol, TIVA, and surgical outcomes, which you might want to refer to. It's a free download from the journal Anesthesia. You can get it on their website and just showing it's not just that uh, propofol has benefits for oncological surgery, but it's got benefits in a whole host of other different areas. I've also written a book about intravenous anesthesia, which uh, kind of makes it, or it's certainly designed to make intravenous anesthesia more easily understood and easy to follow. Um, and it's available from uh, Cambridge um, University Press. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. A uh, very good presentation, Professor Owil. And uh, we've already have a lot of questions for Professor Cordali and Professor Owil. So would you please, if you don't mind, um, answer that questions in Q&A box while we continue our presentation. Uh, the next speaker will be Dr. Kim Jin Tae from uh, Korea. He is a professor in anesthesiology in Seoul National University College of Medicine in South Korea. Uh, please, uh, Professor Kim, time is yours. Dr. Kim, are we connected, Krisa? Yes, there will be a recording. Oh, okay.
Good morning, all in the anesthesia family. I'm Jin Taekin from Seoul, Korea. I express my gratitude to organizing committee, including Su Si Lo, for inviting me this wonderful virtual meeting. I look forward to being able to participate in this wonderful meeting in person next time. What I'm going to do over the next 25 minutes is talking about、uh, perioperative fluid management. No conflict of interest regarding this talk to declare. During my presentation, I would like to talk about how much fluid should be given to our patient, when and how to administer fluid in terms of goal directed fluid therapy, and what type of fluid would be better for our patient outcome. As you know, too much fluid or Too little fluid administration can cause complications. Hypovolemia is associated with、uh, inadequate oxygen delivery to the tissue and organ. On the other hand, hypovolemia is associated with edema, ileus, postoperative nausea and vomiting, and pulmonary complication and heart failure. This graph shows the typical U shape、uh, regarding the instance of morbidity. And、uh, depending on the volume status, the lowest point,、uh, which is normal volemia, is the ideal point. However, it may be difficult to find this point in real clinical practice. It should be noted that this normal volemic point will be various according to patient comorbidity, bowel preparation, and procedure. Preoperative hydration, fasting time, and type of anesthesia. Then, which one is better strategy for fluid management: restrictive fluid management or river fluid management? The fluid management strategy would be restrictive or river in major abdominal surgery. There has been controversy regarding this topic. This study may suggest some clue to the answer and how much fluid should be administered in major abdominal surgery. Previous guidelines to promote the early recovery of patient undergoing major surgery recommend a restrictive intravenous fluid strategy for abdominal surgery. However, the supporting evidence is limited, and there is a concern about impaired organ perfusion. So this study compared the liberal、uh, versus restrictive fluid management. The primary outcome was the disability-free survivor at one year after surgery. As expected, median IV fluid intake was greater in the liberal group than restrictive group, six point one liter versus three point seven liter. The primary outcome was not different between the two groups in this study, but the rate of acute kidney injury was 8.6 percent in restrictive fluid group and 5 percent in the liberal fluid group. So this study favored of the、uh, liberal fluid strategy for abdominal surgery.、Uh, this study shows no difference in primary outcome between two groups. And lower incidence of acute kidney injury in the liberal fluid group, but this study does not support、uh, excessive fluid administration. If you look at the result in more detail, weight gain in liberal group is 1.6 kilogram weight gain, whereas 0.3 kilogram weight gain in the restrictive group. There was not much different between the two groups. In addition, compared with、uh, many previous study comparing the liberal and restrictive fluid management, in this study, relatively less fluid retention was observed in both groups. In fact,、uh, the beneficial effect of liberal fluid management may be changed according to preoperative fasting time, management of hypotension, type of fluid. Also, the minimal invasive surgery 
reduce the metabolic stress and decrease the fluid retention. Accordingly, this result uh, should not be used to support excessive fluid administration uh, during surgery. Later, this study shows that the modestly liberal fluid regimen is safer than a truly restrictive fluid regimen. Uh, keeping normal volemia is important. So, for fluid therapy, in my opinion, since the volume status varies from patient to patient, it would be appropriate to individualize fluid management for each patient. I think it would be better to set zero balance for fluid maintenance for surgery, and it would be better to give fluid generously to avoid inadequate oxygen deliver delivery for fluid resuscitation. For individualized fluid therapy, we need to know if the patient's cardiac output would increase in response to fluid administration. Fluid responsiveness can be predicted by various parameters. Uh, today, I'm not going to talk much about this parameter, uh, the various predictor of fluid responsiveness, but there are several methods to predict fluid responsiveness. With this parameter, we can apply goal-directed fluid therapy in clinical practice. Let me talk more about goal-directed fluid therapy. What is the goal in goal-directed fluid therapy? The goal of goal-directed fluid therapy would be oxygen delivery, cardiac output, or stroke volume, and some study use the blood pressure. Then, if we apply goal-directed fluid therapy, can we improve our patient outcome? This systematic review published in 2018 uh, including the 95 randomized control trial, conclude that perioperative modern goal directed therapy reduced uh, mobility and mortality. With the goal directed therapy, we can decrease the incidence of pneumonia, acute kidney injury, and under infection. But we, when we assess the result of studies about goal directed fluid therapy, we need to consider this factor, which patient is included and uh, within ARAS pro pro protocol, uh, which parameter was used and what is the target and what type of fluid was used and what type of surgery and what type of the algorithm was used and how about the compliance. Let me show the difference in beneficial outcome of goal-directed fluid therapy according to the ERAS program. In these two studies published in the same journal, British Journal of Surgery, the same goal-directed fluid therapy protocol was applied in the same, same surgery, the colorectal surgery, but the ERAS program was not applied in one study, and another study was applied the ERAS program. In one study without ERAS program, all patients was fasted, received bowel preparation, no fluid protocol in the control group, relatively large fluid administration in both groups. This study concludes that the goal-directed fluid therapy lead to a shorter uh, hospital stay and decreased mobility. On the other hand, the study within ERAS program Preoperative carbohydrate drink was applied, avoidance of lutein bowel preparation, avoidance prolonged fasting, zero balance regimen within with a 1.5 liter limit in both groups. Relatively adequate amount of fluid was administered in both groups. This study concluded that goal directed fluid therapy did not provide uh, clinical benefit in patients undergoing elective colorectomy uh, within a protocol incorporating fluid restriction. Likewise, the result of goal-directed fluid therapy would be different according to clinical situation.
Undoubtedly, ERA's program have made intraoperative fluid management easier. Within ERA's protocol, patients are much less likely to be fluid responsive upon arriving in operating room. Therefore, it seems likely that goal-directed fluid therapy is unlikely either to cause harm or to add benefit in healthy patients undergoing uneventful surgery within ERA's pathway. So this review, the Canadian Journal of Anesthesia recommend that all patients should have an individualized plan for fluid management that match the monitoring needs with patient and surgical risk. So if the patient risk is high, then goal-directed fluid therapy recommended, and also surgical risk high, goal-directed fluid therapy recommended. But patient risk and surgical risk is not high, then goal-directed fluid therapy is not indicated, and zero balance fluid management strategy uh, should be applied. Ultimately, the need for goal-directed fluid therapy is specific to patient, surgeon, procedure, and institution. Let me talk about another aspect of goal-directed fluid therapy. This study shows that in patients undergoing open right hepatectomy with an established ERAS uh, program, Use of goal-directed fluid therapy was associated with less intraoperative fluid administration and reduced hospital length of stay when compared to usual care. There was no significant difference in postoperative complication or mobility. If you look at the goal-directed fluid therapy protocol used in this study, uh, you recognize that the protocol is quite complex it would be hard to follow this protocol completely in real clinical practice. We should consider the compliance when we evaluate the goal-directed fluid therapy. So in some study or clinical practice, there are some effort to increase compliance. With this system, for example, the administration of multiple fluid bolus is completely automated are requiring only minimal human intervention. Therefore, compliance with goal-directed fluid therapy protocol um, can, can be improved. So I think that compliance would be an important factor for fluid management when we apply the goal-directed fluid therapy. So when we ask the question about when and how much and how we should administer fluid in major surgery, we should consider following factors to individualize the fluid management. Uh, which patient, the clinical situation, what is target, type of surgery, compliance. Also, I think uh, we need to consider the type of fluid. Then from now on, I'm going to talk about what type of fluid is optimal for goal-directed fluid therapy. This study compared the plasma light and bolo light uh, for goal-directed fluid therapy uh, using closed-loop system. Um, mini fluid challenge 100 ml fluid bolus was used uh, with a closed-loop system and post-operative mobility survey score at uh, post-operative day two is the primary outcome. And this Score include the nine domain, pulmonary, pulmonary complication, infection, renal, cardiovascular, GI, neurologic, hematologic, wound, and pain. This study shows a colloid based on goal-directed fluid therapy was associated with a fewer uh, post-operative complication than the uh, crystalloid. And uh, the, this beneficial effect may be related to lower intraoperative fluid balance when a balanced colloid was used. And, uh, if you look at the data, total intake of fluid uh, was significantly lower in the colloid group. In conclusion, this study was in favor of colloid for goal-directed fluid therapy. 
On the other hand, this randomized control study concluded that the Doppler guidance intraoperative hydroactive starch administration did not significantly reduce the composite of serious complication uh, in the adult having moderate to high risk open and laparoscopic uh, abdominal surgery uh, with general anesthesia. And this study also shows no indication of renal and other toxicity associated with colloid. Another recent study compared the effect of HAS versus saline for volume replacement therapy on death and post-operative complication in high-risk patients. And in this study, uh, there was no difference in primary outcome, composite or deaths, or pre-selected major post-operative complication within two weeks. Uh, if you look into the data in more detail, uh, then you will see that there was not much different fluid balance day one and for day two make a significant difference in primary outcome. It may be difficult to answer to the, the question about which type of fluid would be better for goal-directed fluid therapy. In my opinion, for longer maintaining intravascular volume, colloid is advantageous. If colloid is used and beneficial, I think lower total fluid volume or lower fluid balance would be necessary. If total amount of fluid is not much different, the outcome may not be different. In addition, if colloid is planned to be used, we should keep in mind that the maximum dose of colloid should not be over. And uh, it is prudent that the uh, colloid should not be used in patients with renal dysfunction or with sepsis. Then what about type of crystalloid? The balanced crystalloid versus 0.9% saline. This study compared nomad saline and balanced crystalloid for goal-directed fluid therapy in major abdominal surgery. The primary outcome was the need for vasopressor for maintain target mean order blood pressure. However, this study was terminated early for safety reason, so only 60 patients uh, enrolled in this study. 30 patient crystalloid, 30 patient 0.9 saline. If you look at this graph, you can see that the more uh, vasopressor was needed for the saline group compared with the balanced uh, solution group. And also the pH is lower in saline group and serum chloride and serum sodium concentration is, uh, was higher in saline group. So, with this study, we can say that the balanced crystalloid would be better than the saline for goal-directed fluid therapy. Although there is some controversy uh, based on current evidence, I think the balanced crystalloid would be better than 0.9% saline for goal-directed fluid therapy. Then how about the type of fluid for perioperative period? Balanced crystalloid versus 0.9% saline for critically ill patient and surgical patient. Let me talk about the component of crystalloid. Plasma contains these components and the plasma, right, contain the sodium and uh, potassium, the concentration is similar to those of the plasma, but the plasma light don't have the calcium and no lactate, a little bit higher magnesium concentration. Lactate ring solution contains the sodium, but a little bit lower than plasma. 
and then it contains calcium and lactates. The 0.9% saline contains the sodium and chloride, a relatively higher concentration of sodium and chloride, and relatively higher osmolality. Actually, this review article uh, summarized the detrimental effect of saline-induced uh, hypochloramine metabolic acidosis on cardiovascular and renal system reported in preclinical and clinical research. Then, which fluid is better for critically ill patient, balanced crystalloid versus 0.9% saline? I'm going to introduce four studies regarding this topic. Two studies are negative study and two studies are positive study. The first study is split trial, which include the patient admitted to the intensive care unit and the primary outcome was acute kidney injury. And the result is that no difference in hospital mortality, no difference in the renal replacement therapy, and no difference in the acute kidney injury. Another study is sold to study published in 2017, close the randomized multiple crossover trial, large number of patients admitted included the patient admitted to the medical ICU, comparing the 0.9% saline versus balanced crystalloid. The primary outcome was major advanced kidney injury within 30 days, but no difference was found. However, this study published in 2018 shows a positive result. A large number of patients included the SMART trial. The primary outcome is a major adverse kidney injury within 30 days, higher concentration of chloride in normal saline group, and a lower concentration of bicarbonate in saline group. And the primary outcome was significant difference between the two groups. The major adverse kidney event within 30 days uh, was higher in saline group compared with the balanced crystalloid group. The beneficial effect of the balanced crystalloid was prominent in patients admitted to the medical ICU and neurologic ICU and septic patient and the patient with uh, uh, renal dysfunction. Another study comparing balanced crystalloid versus saline in non-critically ill adult, which one is published in the 2018. The adults who were treated with intravenous crystalloid in emergency department and the, the primary outcome was hospital free day and the total of the 13,000, almost 13,000 patients were enrolled in this study. And this study shows a similar laboratory data, higher in saline group, the higher sodium concentration and higher chloride and bicarbonate is lower in saline group. The major adverse kidney event within 30 days was higher in the saline group. So this study favor of the uh, balanced crystalloid compared with the saline. And also if the patient has a higher creatinine concentration and a higher chloride, the balanced crystalloid was better. Even if large number of patients were include in Lord, all these four study shows no difference in terms of mortality. Then how about 
for such a patient, balanced crystalloid versus 0.9% saline. And this is the older study and small number of patients included. And this study shows more hypochloramic acidosis, more bicarbonate used in normal saline line patient. And, uh, but the, no difference in the other clinical outcomes. This study was observational study and also shows that the more major complication uh, in saline group compared with the balanced crystalloid group and hospital mortality is higher in saline group than the balanced crystalloid group. This study was a retrospective study and this study also shows that the unbalanced crystalloid solution was associated with the poor patient outcome. This one is the meta-analysis, included nine randomized control trials, and also shows that the lower post-operative pH and higher post-operative serum chloride level in 0.9% saline group. This study include children undergoing neurosurgery. And this study conclude that the saline infusion increased the variation in serum chloride compared with the balanced crystalloid and favor of the balanced crystalloid uh, for children undergoing tumor resection. But this study is, uh, shows the no difference in the primary composite major complication between patient received uh, lactate lingo solution and the patient received no saline for colorectal and also pedic surgery. But the, you, it should be noted that each group received uh, uh, relatively uh, small amount of this uh, fluid 1.9 liter was administered. There is a current review regarding this topic and conclude that the current evidence is insufficient uh, to show the effect of the perioperative administration of balanced crystalloid and the non-balanced crystalloid on mortality and organ function in perioperative period. And but uh, they, this uh, Cochrane review conclude that uh, the benefit of buffered fluid were measurable in biochemical term, particularly a reduction in post-operative uh, hypochloramia and metabolic acidosis. So what type of fluid do you choose for your surgical patient? In fact, I prefer balanced crystalloid versus 0.9% saline, especially for patient with bad condition, patient with sepsis, patient with renal dysfunction. And when I have to administer large amount of fluid. Let me talk about normal saline a little bit more. Normal saline is definitely associated with hypochloramic metabolic acidosis. In some studies, it, sh it is associated with increased blood product use and uh, associated with the hyperkalemia in renal transplantation, also renal injury and or need for renal, trans renal replacement therapy and uh, inflammation. In summary, uh, in terms of liberal versus restrictive fluid management, uh, modestly liberal fluid management is okay, and I recommend individualized approach for fluid management. Goal-directed fluid therapy can improve patient outcome, but we need to think of uh, various factors affecting the patient outcome. For goal-directed fluid therapy, colloid and uh, crystalloid can be used and we combination of colloid and crystalloid would be a good choice. And in terms of balanced crystalloid versus 0.9% saline, I prefer the balanced crystalloid for goal-directed fluid therapy. 
the fluid therapy for the critically ill patient, surgical patient, and the balanced crystalloid versus 0.9% saline. Uh, we need to think about patient condition. The patient, if the patient has sepsis and renal dysfunction, I prefer the balanced crystalloid. And uh, if the patient has the uh, laboratory uh, problem, astosis, and uh, then the balanced crystalloid would be better. And then if the, we need to uh, administer large amount of fluid, then the balanced crystalloid is better. And we, when we uh, perform the fluid therapy, the possible, possible side effect of the 0.9% saline should be remembered. Thank you for your kind attention. Hey, thank you very much, Professor Kim, for your nice presentation. Um, uh, for all the speakers, I have informed you that um, we have more than 560 participants today. So it's, I think it's really um, interesting uh, topics that you have uh, presented. Uh, thank you also for the speakers to uh, to to answer all the questions, especially uh, Professor Kodali and Professor Owen. We have still one question. I don't know for who. It's about liver transplant. I think it's for uh, it's uh, for Professor Kim. I think for liver transplant, what food do you recommend? So in terms of the liver transplantation, you know that the liver transplantation is uh, the surgery that require quite a large amount of fluid shift and a lot of bleeding and a lot of fluid shift. So I think that the balanced crystalloid would be better for maintenance, but uh, when we uh, transfuse, uh, but in my institution, uh, we worried about cerebral pontine myelinitis, so we strictly, uh, when we uh, use a 0.9% uh, saline, then we used a half saline for transfusion, and we checked the sodium concentration, is, uh, and we avoid acute change of the sodium concentration during the operation. And in terms of colloid in uh, my institution, that uh, we use the... Uh, 5% uh, albumin was used for liver transplantation, but the other surgery, we used a colloid. So okay. for, for maybe it is the quite uh, general question. So my answer is the balanced crystalloid would be better. And for transfusion, uh, we think about the uh, sodium change during the intraoperative period. All right, thank you. Um, we have a lot of choices of colloids, Professor Kip, and uh, the use of uh, hydroxyethyl starch is, I believe, has decreased in Indonesia due to the possibility of renal toxicity. But we have a lot of other colloids. What do you uh, think about, for example, uh, gelatin colloids? So in terms of the sensitive uh, colloid, in Korea, we use uh, bolurite currently. It's a balanced crystalloid based uh, the, the colloid. Mm. But, uh, but we also worried about uh, uh, the renal toxicity uh, for the critically ill patient. So in Korea, patient in the ICU, we do not use the colloid for uh, patient in the intensive care unit patient. But the intraoperatively uh, during peri uh, during intraoperative, then we uh, if the patient bleeding uh, acutely large amount of bleeding, then we use the colloid also. But mm -hmm. uh, we think about the patient renal function. If the patient uh, renal function is not so good, then mm -hmm. we uh, we don't use the colloid for the volume resuscitation. Okay, in, uh, in the term of uh, renal uh, dysfunction, we should avoid colloids. Yes, I agree. And we should avoid also a lot of 0.9% uh, of saline, right? The yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I agree with sure. you. Yeah, in, in this re uh, related to, to what uh, Professor Kodali have presented about bleeding. 
uh, uh, Prof. Kodali, I have to uh, inform you that uh, vast majority of hospitals in Indonesia don't have thromboelastography, uh, either TG or Rotem. So our problem is we don't know exactly what kind of um, um, bleeding is it. So, so uh, we cannot give uh, an exact uh, transfusion for, for uh, bleeding. Uh, what do you think about blind, blinded giving um, blood, blood product such as um, first frozen plasma, Professor Kodali? So the reason why I also do the red top, you know, even now, despite having thromboelastography and rotum, et cetera, they take time. They take 45 minutes to one hour. So this red top, which I showed you, I, I've been doing this for 10 years, and this actually gives us right away, tells whether the blood is clotting or not clotting. That's number one. Mm -hmm. Number two, when do you give, in absence of laboratory values, when do you give fibrinogen or when do you give, I mean, fresh person plasma? I think when the bleeding is going to be over 2.5 liters and it is an ongoing hemorrhage, mm -hmm. that is why the communication with the obstetricians is essential. If, if they say that, they are not under control and we have already lost 2.5 to 3 liters. I actually give products. I don't even wait for laboratory values. Yes, I take a calculated risk of trolley, but I want the living patient first. We can always uh, treat trolley if it happens and it's a very rare thing too, as I answered in the question already. So around 2.5 to 3 liters, I'm very, very watchful about the blood loss. Now, another thing is, some people come anemic. They may, we may start with a hemoglobin of eight grams or seven grams and losing three liters is, is extraordinary for them. So those are the factors I take into account. Yes, I do start transfusion sometimes without the lab values, just sometimes just based on the, if the red top does not clot at all, for me, I start transfusion right away because I know that patient is coagulopathic all. That's uh, another problem here uh, because uh, not any blood products is uh, yes. available here, especially uh, Prof. Kodeli, in a month of Ramadan, of yes. uh, festive season, we have yes. very difficulty in, um, in blood products. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so this is uh, connected to what uh, Professor uh, Kim just mentioned that in order to maintain the blood, uh, volume and cardiac output, we sometimes uh, have to give a lot of fluid. Fluids, yes. Uh, but See, that is, yes, yeah, yeah. I agree with you. That is why the morbid, maternal morbidity and mortality is still you know, high. After 400, 500 years, we are still talking about hemorrhage in every meeting. Yes. And, and, and that is because of the complexity of the you know, circumstances as you described. Yes. And uh, so I don't know what is the answer. Maybe they should stock more blood during before the Ramadan months <laughs> for the use in those months. I don't know. <laughs> Our problem is pregnant patients is not never stopping. <laughs> you know, I know. We have, we have um, yes. uh, around... 17,000 islands, Professor, in Indonesia. Yes. And yeah. uh, obstetric anesthesia is a never ending story here. Yeah. And uh, yeah. a lot of hospitals have nothing. So, this is, I think, uh, this information is, uh, I use, uh, I hope, is useful for our friends in, in rural area and small hospitals. Uh, if we don't have anything, just uh, give fluid, enough fluid, not too much, but not less, in order to save the patient's life. Yes. 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 Thank you very much. Yeah, that is so absolutely... Wants to add something, Dr. Ratna. Yes. Yes, Krisa. I think Hello? Prof. Erwin wants to add something. Yeah, sorry, I was... Uh, oh, sorry, I, was, I didn't see that. Okay, yeah, first, that's okay. Please. That's okay, just... Uh, I'll, uh, don't worry. 
Um, no, it was just that uh, when we were when we were discussing the uh, the, the colloids, and you you mentioned uh, gelatin. I think it's important to point out that uh, gelatin is very uh, commonly associated with anaphylaxis, and that's another uh, consideration yeah. when you're choosing uh, appropriate fluids. I think in the in the NAP six audit, which was done in the UK, it was one of the uh, commonest agents for uh, anaphylaxis, along with uh, rock thorium. And there was a big study in Australia, which found a a, a lot of uh, incidence of uh, uh, gelatin anaphylaxis, so much so that they in Australia they call it gelophylaxis. And they, they, the problem uh, which is common commonly occurs that can be, a, we actually had a mortality in one of the hospitals I work in related to this, is that uh, the, the, the colloid is often given because the patient is hypotensive and tachycardic. They then develop a, a anaphylaxis to become more hypotensive and tachycardic. Mm -hmm. And the, the diagnosis of anaphylaxis is often markedly delayed. That actually, that's actually what happened in, in the, one, one of our hospitals uh, and resulted in a patient mortality. So I think it's just a, something to mention that, that we need to think about. Yeah. Uh, so it's between the devil and deep sea sometimes. Mm -hmm. If you don't have anything, you don't. Uh, you only have uh, some crystalloids, and for colloids, you have uh, only gel or starch. And for albumin, albumin is quite um, expensive, Doctor Kim. Yeah. yeah. And it's difficult to get yeah. in a lot of countries as well, actually. Yes, often, I believe yeah. that. Yeah. So uh, sometimes what we face is very difficult. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, the hemorrhagic and perioperative obstetric anesthesia is very high and still yeah. ongoing until now. So uh, it's uh, something that's very uh, difficult how to uh, save the patients. So we have to play play a game between uh, crystalloids and what color it have uh, yeah. until we can get the blood products available for our patients. So friends in all part of Indonesia, don't be give up in helping our patients. Just do what you can do to save our patients. And uh, is there any other question? Oh yeah, we have a new question for for Professor Kodali, what kind of blood you recommend for acute bleeding? Is it fresh, a whole blood, or pet cell? Uh, uh, no, I mean whatever blood the blood bank gives, we give. Uh, we, I mean, I mean, we give it. There is nothing called as a fresh blood or uh, anything like that. So you know, any blood. Uh, first of all, we are talking that whether the blood is available itself. Whatever blood is available, great. Just we give it. And that is how we get actually O negative or O positive blood right away. Yeah. And, uh, uh, you know, and, but, you know, going back to your thing, I have read that at some places there are now the new technology they are using to deliver blood to some hospitals using drones. And <laughs> uh, yes, I think, I think we have to come up with some innovative ideas to, to help pregnant patients, yeah. you know, it's a good, uh, uh, a good idea for Jakarta, Professor Kodai, since we have a very traffic issues. traffic jam. So yes. <laughs> you know, and I, I think, no, you have to come up with a, with a, with some sort of, a, you know, and actually Indonesia is very good in drones too. That's where I read somewhere. And uh, so uh, we have to come up with some sort of a novel ideas mm -hmm. of how, how to manage you know, these patients, because transporting the patients and a bleeding patient is yeah. very difficult, as you know. Yes. And uh, uh, yeah, especially you know. in Indonesia. Yes. Yeah, you know. very difficult. Yeah, Indonesia, India, and even, see, the problem is, the even like I was just reading about three days ago, the maternal mortality has gone up even in the United States, despite, you know, all the available things. So yeah. that means, pro yes, so... Uh, you know, we have to do what we can and try to improve upon it. Yeah, I agree. Uh, 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 one more thing that uh, we, we are facing a lot of uh, obstetric anesthesia, then we sometimes we forget uh, our cancer patients. You know, the focus is uh, because cancer patients, 
not in you know emergency situation like obstetric uh, patients. So sometimes we we don't really take care of a special aspects on cancer patient like uh, what Professor Irwin have uh, presented. Uh, I think it's uh, quite new for us that a lot of uh, intravenous anesthesia have a beneficial effects on cancer patient. And uh, but opioid is, is uh, usually used here for uh, intraoperatively or for um, uh, chronic pain management. Mm -hmm. But propofol for intra-anesthesia uh, drug, I think it's, well, thank you for the information, Dr. Erwin. No problem. <laughs> Um, there's nothing wrong. I just want to stress that you know there's nothing wrong with using opioids. Uh, the the um, those studies, early studies, were as I say, often retrospective and very underpowered. I, I think if you look at any evidence that's good, you know, uh, fairly well powered and prospective, there there doesn't seem to be any evidence to suggest that opioids are dangerous for patients with cancer. And, and in fact, as you say, uh, one of the most important things is ensuring that your patient is comfortable because good analgesia is very important in terms yes. of return yes. to intended oncological therapy. It's very important in terms of patient comfort and uh, psychology. So I think that would take precedence over, over anything else. The, the issue of, um, of propofol and cancer is a really fascinating one, actually, I think, because you know, you would never imagine that such a apparently minor intervention or choosing one type of anesthesia over another could, could potentially make such a difference. But there is increasing evidence that it really could. And I think that's really quite, quite, uh, quite exciting. But as I say, still a lot of work ongoing in this area. Don't worry if you don't have access to propofol and so on. Just, you know, continue to give good anesthesia. Um, make sure your patients are comfortable and make sure you get them back to their normal uh, status and, and uh, ordinary therapy as soon as you possibly can. Are you still uh, doing your research, uh, Dr. Owen? Yes, we're, st we're just starting some work looking at cancer or tumor organoids because a lot of the, a lot of the um, studies were look, look at cell cultures and a lot of problems with just looking at cell cultures. Uh, cancer cell organoids, I'm not sure if you know about this, but they are basically fully functioning uh, tumors. <clears throat> so you can grow these fully functioning tumors, and then you can see how these tumors react to different external uh, stimuli, such as drugs and so on. It's a relatively new thing, which is being used now to personalize uh, chemotherapy for patients with, uh, with certain types of cancer. You can grow their tumor organoid, and then you can see which uh, chemotherapy agents are most effective, least toxic in that, uh, in that individual. So we, we are using that uh, technology, which is quite new, uh, working with um, oncologists in, in the university uh, to look at the effects of different, uh, various different drugs, including opioids actually, uh, but propofol and so on as well. All right, very interesting, but mm -hmm. I don't think that Indonesia is close to that. Um, it's not, it's not, maybe not uh, close to doing that type of research, you know, uh, obviously, but I mean, uh, you, and, and also I understand it may be difficult to get, you know, propofol to use TIVA or to have the equipment to deliver it safely, you know, like things like TCI and so on. Propofol actually is getting cheaper and cheaper now anyway, because it's a generic drug. So in fact, um, it, it's interesting, um, we we did a around the time of the World Congress. Uh, we we <coughs> we did a survey uh, asking delegates and so on about Tiva and why they wouldn't use it. And one of the things that came up was people thought it was uh, expensive. And when we published this, we got a couple of um, people from uh, Australia actually wrote to us and said that they'd done a big cost analysis and found that uh, Provol is actually uh, a lot cheaper. Than using things like desflurane, sevaflurane, and comparable to using drugs like isoflurane. So, in fact, it's not expensive, um, but I, I do understand that most people are taught to use inhalation anesthesia. They, you need to get pumps and so on. That's one of the reasons I wrote the book, you know, taking on Tiva because I want to make 
demystify it, make it fairly simple. But anyway, aside from that, don't worry if you don't know how to use Diva and so on. I think it, what we do know is good quality analgesia, yes, uh, you know, good anesthesia, enhanced recovery programs. They they are also very important in getting your patient back to their normal status and back to their normal uh, intended mm -hmm. oncological therapy. Yeah, thank you. Okay, we have another question for Professor Kim. What about pediatric patients or frail geriatric patients? Is there any different ongoing uh, goal-directed flu therapy? Yes, uh, in terms of the goal-directed uh, flu therapy in pediatric patient, the biggest difference is the predictor. In adult patient, uh, you know that the pulse pressure variation, systolic pressure variation, or stroke volume variation can be used to predict fluid responsiveness. But these parameters are not well functioning in pediatric patient. Mm -hmm. so, so in pediatric patient, uh, there are many studies that uh, favor of the, the respiratory variation, aortic blood flow peak velocity, or pulse uh, plus variability index, uh, it is from Massimo device is uh, relatively well functioning in pediatric patients. So in pediatric patients, the biggest difference is between other patients would be a uh, predictor itself. And in terms of geriatric old patient, uh, fray patient, I think that the, you know, the, the, the compliance and vascular elastance is quite different is normal patient in in pediatric patient and old patient. So when we apply the commonly used uh, parameter like a systolic pressure variation in old patient, then you know that parameter may be uh, inaccurate. So I think that when we apply the goal-directed fluid therapy in pediatric patient and even in old geriatric patient, we think about the hemodynamic condition and the uh, cardiac function and vascular tone itself. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then if you give a fluid a bolus challenge, I think it is prudent that not much fluid. And uh, I think that uh, uh, if you give a fluid a little bit, then evaluate the patient and then apply the volume or the pass pressure or cardiac increase uh, or inotropics. Mm -hmm. So I think that there is uh, some difference uh, in the pediatric patient and the uh, geriatric or, or fray patient. Agreed with that, especially for geriatric patient, we have to be more careful because of the, uh, the whole cardiovascular function probably is decreased. So uh, it's patient to patient not to be uh, generalized everything, right, Dr. Kim? We still yes. have two minutes more. Dr. Susilo is, a, is practicing obstetric anesthesia, but I don't know whether Dr. Susilo facing bleeding. <laughs> no. <laughs> what about your opinion, Dr. Susilo? <laughs> yeah, we are lucky in Indonesia um, because I found that uh, in Jakarta, not so many uh, bad patients. <laughs> We are lucky because, yeah, in my uh, in private hospital, only a few cases every year that have the big problem like we uh, discussed today. I think, but we we, we face it. Yeah, we, we know every day that Bafani and colleagues already uh, mention every time that we should have the protocol of this uh, uh, problem. I think that's all, uh, yeah. uh, Fida. Still, think, uh, uh, yes, Dr. Owen? I think uh, the, 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 as, as has been mentioned by the speakers, you know, the, the protocol and actually practicing protocol is really, really important. I mean, uh, I'm, I'm not an obstetric anesthetist either, but I know in our hospital, we run regular drills uh, so that everybody knows exactly what to do uh, should such an uh, event occur, albeit rare but at least uh, everyone's prepared for it when it happens. There, there was a, um, a private hospital year which had a mortality 
and were very they were very heavily criticised because they didn't have uh, a drill for a major obstetric hemorrhage, and nobody actually knew really knew what to do, and that was that was the main issue. I agree, Michael, because we also uh, have uh, every year since two thousand five. When Dr. Mike Kinsella came to Indonesia, mm. he teach us about workshop fire drill of obstetric emergency, and we do it for our resident in uh, our hospital with Vida. Mm. We are lucky that that uh, drill is very good, very uh, useful for very us. Very useful, in, yes. Yeah, mm. I think yeah. that's. It. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, everybody, our um, remarkable speakers and the very nice topics. Very good information for us. And I think time is up. I will be, oh, thank you. Applause for our participants too. Uh, okay. Yes. And for our speakers. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. It is close to 600 now. Yeah, yeah oh, more. <laughs> yeah, more than 600 <laughs> participants. Okay, Krisa. I'll give it back to you. Thank, Thank you. you, Dr. Thank you. Ratna Farida, for moderating this morning session. It is a, it has been a very interesting discussion with all the speakers. Uh, I would like to thank Prof. Bofani. Thank you for sparing your Saturday night, I believe. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much, uh, Prof. Merwin uh, and Prof. Kim. Thank you very much for spending your thank time you. with us. I hope that everyone stay safe, stay healthy. And hopefully next year, who knows, we can see each other again in Indonesia and to spend another Indo Anesthesia meeting with you guys. Thank and you. Thank you thank for you. Ratna Farida. Yeah. The best. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much indeed. Yeah. Because it's a bright thank day, you doctor. So much. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye.